All right, we're going we're to start. Good crowd. <laughs> and we're going to try to go quickly. We're going to do 30 minutes of throw acronyms and intense technical information, and then we'll save 10 minutes at the end for questions. So. All right, we're going to start. I am Anita Tragler. I'm a product manager at Red Hat focused on NFV and networking, looking at data path acceleration and network orchestration. Uh, my name is Greg Smith. I'm a product manager in the broadband group at Juniper Networks, actually based here in Westford. My specialty is virtual BNG. And I actually went to high school five blocks from here, so glad people are here in Boston. Welcome. And how many of you have, uh, are new to NFV? And uh, or starting, just starting with NFE. Wow, there are some. And the rest of you, I'm assuming, are already familiar with NFE and are working with it for some time. All right, moving on. This is the only introduction slide we have on NFE. Uh, I guess there's some delay. Uh, no, I think you got to go down. Uh, yeah, I think you got to take it off. F7. That's F8. Oh, sorry. So for NFE, we are taking the network functions that are already on your appliance, that used to be on your appliance, and taking the software pieces of it and rerunning it on, on servers, on uh, COT servers, what they call off-the-shelf commercial servers. And you can see that all of the top service providers, both in North America, Europe, and Asia, and Europe, are all moving or looking to move in the next three to five years to virtualize all of their networking functions. This is an overview of what Etsy NFE defines as the network architecture. Uh, at the top, we have a lot of orchestration pieces that are very close to service providers. And at the bottom is what we have, our NFE infrastructure. And we're going to focus mainly on the NFE infrastructure, the virtualization. And then we see where OpenStack comes in, in the virtual infrastructure manager. And we have the VNFs, like Juniper's VBNG, sitting at the VNF layer right above the infrastructure. This is showing where Red Hat and OpenStack fit in. Um, you have your OS and your o OpenStack platform, which both runs in your virtual infrastructure manager, which is the controller. And then you have all the agents that sit on your compute nodes. Yeah, so we're going to try to tuck in seven key challenges. And I'll go over, uh, we're going to take a very specific application. And I was just watching the last presentation. It was fantastic. Um, but uh, that was sort of thinking about how we would do it. We're going to talk about if you had to do it today or next week, how would we do it? Um, so we're going to try to touch on uh, seven things, if you will. Performance, connectivity, multi-site, multi-tenancy, programmability, high availability, and security. So like I said, we're going to have to throw it at you really fast. Um, but we're going to take the use case, my favorite use case, broadband networks, virtual broadband network gateway. So here's your three minutes, what is broadband? Uh, the home, so there's hundreds of thousands of homes on the left. Each one connects to a, what we call an access node. And that's a one-to-one -one wire. There's probably thousands. So think about in a country like Italy. There's 4 million broadband users. There's 4,000 access node locations. We'll call that the central office. Then there's potentially an aggregation network. And then there's um, the uh, POP, if you will. And there's about 600 of those POPs where you see VBNG and VLAC. And then there's a core that's like two or three cores. So it's, think about it like a tree aggregating up. And the key of broadband is you turn on the DSL modem or your ONT in your home. It sends out a DHCP discover, says, I need an IP address. That's a broadcast message. No destination IP. It's a layer two broadcast. The access node hears that, inserts two, Q, two VLAN tags, Q and Q VLAN, and forwards the broadcast message. Again, no destination IP address to the virtual BNG. The virtual BNG hears it. It says, oh, you're on VLAN 100 outer tag, VLAN 10 inner tag. Who, who is that? That's 100 Main Street, Raleigh. Oh, it's Anita. Looks you up in the database. Says, oh, and has Anita paid her bill? Yes. How much bandwidth did she get? Voice, video, and data. 
And so then we apply it, we give you an IP address. So that's what we call a broadband network gateway. So this stresses the OpenStack cloud in a couple of ways. Right now, there's the broadband network gateway is about half a rack high. It can aggregate hundreds of thousands of uh, broadband subscribers and terabits of bandwidth. So there's probably, you could do the city of Boston with like three, and they cost hundreds of thousands. Um, so it's a lot of bandwidth. If you're gonna play in the broadband space, I mean, 5G is nice. Look forward to seeing 5G someday. Right now, we drive a lot of bandwidth. Um, the other thing is that um, L2 connectivity, and we'll go back over that a couple of times, but we need to see a VLAN from the home through the network, through the cloud gateway router, through the Tor, through the host operating system, and the virtual switch if it's there, into the guest VM. All, both those layer two tags have to be there. If the layer two tags aren't there, it won't work. So that's a biggie. Uh, and then the other one is that there's a lot of locations. And that's one of the beautiful things about this application is that um, it's pretty much impossible to put in the public cloud because it's physically tied to the network. So fortunately for us, uh, when, you know, Amazon Web Services isn't really a, a viable at this time, maybe someday in the future. Um, so a lot of locations, and we'll talk about multi-tenancy. Once you get the packets into the cloud through the BNG, you want to be able to do things with it, you want to be able to program it, and you want to be able to distribute security. So that's our application, and generally, Anita and I talk every, every now and then, and I say, this is the hard thing I want to do, and then she says, well, Red Hat could do that, and tells me how, so now we're going to share that with you. Um, so the first thing I ask for is 40 gig bi-directional for 512 byte packets on a single socket. I like to have 10 cores for my application, VB and G. Um, so that's what we can do with SRIOV today. Uh, the open question is, can we do that with Vert IO? Um, so that was the challenge I gave to Anita, and Anita said, pretty much yes, any date now. And I think we're already doing it, right? Well, let's see, I want to see the test. <laughs> Show them how we would do it. So this is the data path options that we have today for OpenStack. Open, the first one on the left is OpenV switch. That is the default data path when you configure anything and you don't make any changes and you deploy your OpenStack, uh, you get OpenV switch on your compute node. And this has a kernel data path. It has, it has a user space um, OpenV switch for configuration and then moves to the kernel data path. And then we move on when you want exhilaration and you want higher performance. And Greg says, hey, I want 10 million packets per second. We're like, okay, let's try something different. Let's move to SRIOV. And SRIOV or DPDK, um, Data Plane Development Toolkit, both of these are options to bypass the kernel uh, and to give you higher performance to uh, avoid the interrupts and the latencies from the kernel. Uh, they both do it in different ways. SRIOV has a dependence on the NIC. It, you need uh, virtual functions available from the NIC and you're tied to your hardware. You have a hardware dependency in this case. And a lot of deployments today are entirely SRIOV. Very few are moving today with um, Red Hat OpenStack now has full GA support for OVS DPDK, which is open switch with the DPDK accelerated path. And now we are seeing customers starting to move and taking that path. And the reason why is they don't want to be dependent on the hardware NIC, um, even though the CPU overhead is low and they want some switching functions. They want to be able to do bonding in the host itself. Uh, they want to be able to do some security groups. They want to be able to do um, uh, live migration of their VNFs. And with the DPDK, you have the advantage of having a switch so you can do live migration, you can do bonding, you can do encapsulation some in, without having to depend on your top of rack TRR. Uh, and you can do some overlays. But with DPDK, there's a cost to it. You have to allocate some cores for, and memory for your, for your performance needs. Yeah, let me just take this opportunity to say, yeah, keep flip ahead, we'll, we'll go quickly through these next few. But the, uh, we talk a lot about OVS. I work for Juniper, we have the Contrail V router. Pretty much everything we say about OVS is doable with a V-Router, especially if there's any Contrail people in the room. So uh, think about it like the virtual switch. So this one, now this one shows a more complicated layout of how we can achieve all of these options together. Um, we have control plane and signaling VNFs, virtual network functions, that can sit and use OVS 
the way it is today. You can have your default configuration. And the way uh, OpenStack deploys today and OVS deployment, it will have uh, either a Linux bridge or a OVS BR integration. And then you have OVS, either an external bridge or a, a, a tunnel bridge. And that allows you to do encapsulation. Usually, the external bridge takes you directly out to the internet. And it gives you the floating IPs that allow, allow you to have internet uh, uh, connectivity and gives you, that's your data path. Usually the blue is the north-south or the data path for high throughput applications, data going in and out. And anything that is east-west, traffic that is going between VMs, you use um, tunneling like VXLAN or, or VLANs, and there you have your tunneling bridge. Now, if you're using SRIOV, you're typically looking at your data path, your fast throughput data path. Uh, if you, your data plane VNFs, we have two of them. One of them is using SRIOV, and the other one is OVS DPDK, which has three NICs coming in. And you have to separate each NIC, because each NIC, you don't want to have your telecom traffic, data traffic being tied up with your management traffic. So you need to have separate NICs for your data and your control plane and your management. And the management is the open stack management to bring up your uh, uh, nodes, your compute nodes and to provide the services, NAT, DVR, DHCP. In addition to uh, deploying this, uh, the, the data paths, you have to worry about performance tuning. Uh, for SRIOV, there is no cost. You don't have to do much to performance tune on the host, other than allocate a couple of uh, cores for the host management purposes. Uh, you could probably manage with one core, but we recommend two cores. And the rest of the cores available are available to your VNFs. And we can get almost bare metal performance uh, with SRIOV. That means you can run 21 million packets per second bidirectional, uh, which is line rate, the best that we can get. Now, for OVS DPDK, that's when you have to allocate some cores. Uh, you can see that you, in addition to allocating CPU cores dedicated for OVS DPDK, they need to be isolated uh, CPUs, and you have to have huge pages. Uh, you can see that we have taken out on each NUMA node, on each socket, you have to take out at least a couple uh, cores for, for switching for OVS DPDK for your PMDs, which are your pole mode drivers, uh, running at 100% CPU most of the time so that you can have the throughput that you want. We will look at the performance that we have. One caveat is you cannot have OVS and OVS DPDK running, running together uh, on the same node, but in the, in the previous uh, presentation, we showed that with Newton, we have composable roles today, so you can do uh, um, a combination of your data path. You can run OVS with SRIOV, or you can run SRIOV with DPDK on the same host. By, by creating roles and identifying roles uh, for your VNFs and say this VNF set of VNFs will have a combination of SRIOV and OVS. And here's a sample of what we call a PVP test, physical, virtual, physical. Uh, throughput test that we do in um, all of our testing for benchmarking our vSwitch. And, and we want predictable linear performance. That what, that's what the BNG needs. So it starts off with, we start off with one queue and one core. And then we move up and we assign more cores. And each PMD is one vCPU or one thread. So two PMDs make one core, assuming hyperthreading. So you can see there's a nice linear graph for 64 byte frames, and that's what we would like to have as we uh, increase or provide more cores to our vSwitch, to our DPDK vSwitch. So we can do with 64 byte frames about 5 million packets per second. Uh, and if, in order to achieve 10 million packets per second, which are required by the BNG, we're asking for at least two to three cores. Roundabout, we are roughly just below 10 million packets per second at, at two cores. Uh, yeah, so maybe just sanity check that. that that's the performance section. So SRIOV is the best thing today. Vert.io is getting better using uh, VRAT or OVS DPDK. There's no free lunch. You have to give a couple of cores to the host operating system, but it's going to approach 10 million packets, and maybe that's enough. Everyone comfortable with Vert.io and SRIOV? Anyway, we'll be here afterwards if you want to hear it in more detail. 
So uh, yeah, the throughput is getting there. Um, the next question is layer two connectivity. So I kind of already went over this, but basically there's two Q and Q tags. And so if, if, first of all, I need VLANs in the guest VM. The virtual BNG is the guest. I need to see the VLAN that arrives at the physical NIC in the guest VM exactly as it arrives at the physical NIC. The basic reason is that the outer tag represents Main Street and the inner tag represents 100 Main Street, literally. So the two tags together give me the exact address. I can look up Anita once I see those two tags. And I, of course, I have the database. Um, so I hope that's clear. This is, you know, you hear a lot of people say layer two, why do you need layer two? And most, almost all clouds that I run into, they're all layer three. No, you can't have the VLANs. This, it's a deal breaker for the virtual BNG, so. Um, fortunately, it's mostly solved um, at this point. So yeah, uh, Q and Q tags, sometimes they're called SVLAN, CVLAN, sometimes they're called stacked VLAN, sometimes they're inner and outer tags, but the bottom line is, is two tags. Um, is this mine? Okay, so I'll just mention that what often happens is the tags get stripped either at, by the driver in SRIOV or by OVS or, or, or by vRouter potentially, and they get dropped in the host operating system. People use, usually use VLANs to say VLAN 1 is guest 1, VLAN 2 is guest 2. So they're used for other meanings, but, but for broadband we need the raw VLAN as it came in. So um, also to add to this, this is a new feature added in Newton. Uh, for OpenStack, and the whole point is to be able to uh, not strip out the VLANs as needed by the BNG to, in order to support VLAN trunking between both your OVS vSwitch or your OVS DPDK vSwitch. You need to have the VLANs trunking available directly straight into the VNF. And the other issue that uh, Greg mentioned was VLAN stripping at the NIC. So your NIC vendor, you have to verify the driver on the NIC vendor because it's highly dependent on, on your driver on the NIC vendor. Some NIC vendors don't support it, and, and that's where you have run into problems. And so this is the, the ETH tool command with v, Rx VLAN filter off. It sometimes does not work on some NIC drivers, and this has been fixed. So that's something that to look out for. Uh, regarding L3 connectivity, um, QoS policy, this is a, a new feature that was added in, again in Newton, uh, to be able to add or set your TOS or DSCP. This works great if you have a single IP tag, but when you're running cases where you have VXLAN or GRE, and I think Greg has some services where they're gonna do VXLAN or GRE, and then you have an outer tag and an inner IP tag, and today we do not have the capability to inherit from the inner. Uh, or set a unique value for the inner. And these are important because you want to set different, you might want to change your QoS for your inner and outer. And this is work in progress. It is being looked at. Uh, it's supported on OVS. It needs to be added to Neutron. Yeah, third challenge. So we, get, we covered through, high performance throughput, layer two connectivity, multiple sites. And this one we're just going to touch on because there's other presentations that uh, talk about it. But, as we saw before, you'd like to put these uh, servers or compute nodes, if you will, out near the edge in, in say, your pops, um, or eventually in the COs. Again, this in a country the size of Italy, there's hundreds of pops, thousands of COs. So if you could have, and, and it's critical that the um, compute node be at that physical location in the network, the layer two, layer three boundary, which is what the BNG represents. Um, ha has a certain very uh, tight restrictions on where it can be. And without going into too, too deep in the weeds here, um, the backhaul, that IPMPLS aggregation network, is really expensive. If you want to carry a VLAN from, if let's say my BNG was in uh, New York City and I'm trying to connect from Boston and you want to carry a layer two VLAN over a transport network, you need a really expensive piece of fiber and some really expensive rotoms and other fiber equipment on either side. Much easier if it's IP. So where the BNG sits, you in Boston, you have a BNG. It turns the packet from layer two into IP. Now you don't, you're not tied to a VLAN over the long haul. It gets carried through the MPLS tunnel and pops out the other side. So um, anyway, a little bit too much networking perhaps there. But the, the point is many locations. And one of the things we think about when we look at locations is uh, compute, OpenStack compute node is actually doing money-making work for me. The control node is great, it manages my cloud, necessary thing, but the more compute nodes I have, the more revenue I can generate with, from my hardware. 
So I think of the control nodes as overhead, not, not the disk, the great work people do on, on, on OpenStack control nodes. But um, you want to minimize the ratio of compute to control. So if you put everything in one location, which I'm showing on the right there, and put it in, I think that's Montreal, uh, you have 16 servers, two of them are control, and 12 of them, or what did I say? Uh, two are control and 16 are compute out of your 18 servers. So that's good. Most of my, my hardware that I buy is actually making money for me, sending forwarding packets, connecting broadband subscribers. If you distribute it, you might run into a situation where you have to have a control node in every location. Now I've got six control nodes and 12 compute nodes. So of my 18 servers, I've got a smaller fraction of them making money. So the question that I, you know, rhetorically saying Anita, but really OpenStack community, the thing I throw out to you is, how, how can I have a remote location with a minimum of control node computing necessary? And these are service provider networks. So if someone would stand up and say 100 milliseconds maximum latency, then you know, no problem. I'll go tell Bell Canada they need 100 milliseconds between Montreal and Toronto, and they'll either do it or they won't. So that's the challenge for, for the broadband network application is um, how can we distribute the compute nodes um, and minimize the amount of control node capacity we need in each location. Right, so let's look, at a, let's look at Greg's problem in a little more detail. So here we have two POPs or points of presence uh, that Greg recommended as his remote sites, that he's putting some services on the remote site, um, some DHCP termination, PPPoE termination, and some video on demand cache for Netflix or something and he has a router sitting there. And, and he is only serving a small region or small area, so he doesn't have a lot of compute, and he doesn't want to put a whole lot of control nodes over there. And then in, he has his core site and his data center where he has additional services that he puts in there um, in case optional or, or maybe control plane services, but all his data plane and high throughput is moved to the edge so that he can, he doesn't have to use a lot of bandwidth. And let's look at what what we have with OpenStack available today. Um, so this is a very new project. Uh, open, multi-site for OpenStack is a big uh, topic of discussion on how to solve this problem. Um, there is another talk tomorrow uh, for, by a solutions architect from Red Hat who's going into in-depth on multi-site, and I would recommend if anybody's interested to definitely attend it. He goes into all the different types of scenarios, mini, ultra, and, and really small ultra light. Uh, OpenStack deployments uh, for remote edge sites. So over here, you have two options. One is, as Greg pointed out, put a control node on the edge and um, try to make it a hyper-converged architecture where you can get everything on, instead of doing, deploying high redundancy and uh, three control nodes required, put a single node and hope for the best, uh, and give a very lightweight hyper-converged uh, compute as well. Or the other option is uh, remove the control node, run headless, and then have your controller at, a, at your central site, and then have, have a, a latency limit, or what is the maximum number of latency that you can support, and the scale of number of pops that you can support. And this needs to be benchmarked. There are some numbers right now, but they're not concrete. We're still working on them. So this is definitely work in progress. And have a private VPN between your pops and your uh, data center. Good. Moving on to number four. All right, number four. So why multi-tenancy? And by multi-tenancy, I just mean different kinds of um, VNFs, with, each with their own path through the cloud. Um, and so what I'm proposing here is um, a high throughput SRIOV path that runs north-south. That's your leftmost uh, um, dotted lines. And then a lower throughput. but getting much better now with OPS and VRAR, DPDK, east-west path through the, through the cloud. And so you might be bringing a broadband packet in, passing some fraction of the broadband packets to DPI. It says, you know, my kids are watching something they shouldn't be. Comes back to broadband, says drop that packet. But there's, a, you know, there's an east-west path, and, and there's multiple east-west paths, which... Um, yeah, maybe you can explain that, and then I'll go into the next mm, one. Right. But uh, yeah, so multi, do people feel comfortable with multi-tenancy, many different kinds of paths through the network and many different kinds of applications on your compute nodes. Also critical for BBPNG. Right, and so this one, this one gives you the east-west services, 
uh, and you have your BNG sitting on the, on the right, and it has three types of uh, uh, connections available and configured by your Neutron network uh, uh, and services, both firewall, NAT, DVR, uh, DHCP services, and you have your NIC, NICs coming in that are carrying all these different tra traffic. It could all be on the same NIC, or it could be on different NICs. That's up to you uh, for your east-west traffic. So you have your high-throughput traffic coming in, and some of that traffic is uh, allocated by the BNG for some value-added services uh, that the BNG is offering. And for example, you have deep, deep packet inspection, firewall services, or you have video on demand services. And those subset of uh, customers or are shipped over on an east-west train to a different VNF to, in order to uh, service them. And this could be in a different location. It could be on a central site, or it could be on a different host, but on the same site. And then you have VXLAN tunneling or VLAN tunneling to segregate your tenants and your services. Okay, a little, little hard to read. Uh, <laughs> So um, yeah, this is for programmability. So you might want one path. Let's see if I can even get the colors on that right. Customer A, DHCP, POE, that's the VPNG. Customer A is going to get firewall, uh, firewall, NAT, and DPI. And customer B only gets firewall and no DPI. And these things change all the time. So the idea is that the service provider sells like a high security firewall service to you. And then there's some operator in the service provider network, they click a button in there provisioning GUI, it, this is my dream anyway, for open FE people to deliver someday. Uh, and then um, the BNG knows which um, subscriber that is, it provisions a new path through the cloud, and now we redirect the packets for that subscriber to the firewall service. That dynamic, that easy. But the idea is multiple paths, easily programmable. Which, of course, it's all possible with Python scripts today, but the question is how, how much architecture that we need to put around it to make it service provider class stuff. Right, so Greg wants it on the click of a button. So that's the hard part, I think. To be able to, to, be able to chain these services one after another, or as on demand, when services come up on demand, yeah. to be able to do these uh, capabilities. And for that, we need OpenStack and Neutron to be able to talk to an SDN controller. And then the policies are being pushed by the service provider to the SDN controller, right. as well as uh, the, the, and you have different options, as well as the Neutron agent sending all configurations to the SDN controller. And you have different options for an SDN yeah. controller. I think the last presentation really covered it well. In fact, if, I don't know if they're still here, but someone was asking for a test case. That's, uh, I'm happy to give you that test case. Give me a button that says, apply a firewall to any customer based on their address. I'll give you the customer database. I'll give you the filters to make the path. All you got to do is uh, edit the switches and uh, your configuration of the switches and the servers. And, and also work in progress is um, adding support for NSH, which is a new header, which allows you to have multiple layers of uh, services that, are, that will follow. Mm. So this is a dynamic header that is injected by your SDN controller at the edge of the network, and based on uh, the stack of services, you will know automatically via the data path what, what path that um, packet is going to take because you push on these headers on top of the packet as soon as it enters on the edge that, Good. hey, customer A is going to have this set of services. All right, we've got two minutes to get to questions. So it just has anyone heard of NSH? Does anyone really like it? Just heard of it, thinking about it? Okay. So two more. So one minute each. One minute each. Uh, high availability. <laughs> to do it in one minute is incomprehensible. But uh, I'm just going to, first of all, boil it down to the server and the, and the Tor. Um, and it's funny, because uh, in networking, we call it lag or aggregated Ethernet. And in, in, everyone, in servers, they call it bonding. But we're talking about the same thing, bonding two ports together, making them look like one port. Really important feature. Definitely something you got to think about. you got to run multi-chassis lag on your Tor so that they don't fail. And you run what I call lag on the server. Um, or b bonding on the server to make sure that your NIC or your wire gets cut, you won't die. Uh, three different ways to do it. Depends on whether you're running SRIOV or vert IO. Uh, so pay attention to lag and, and to pick your, the place where you're going to do the lag bundling. That's really all I can say at this point. <coughs> Excuse me. And looking quickly is what we have today for OpenStack deployments. For 
uh, SRIOV. SRIOV, the bonding happens at the top of rack switch and at the guest. Uh, there is no switch in the, in the host to do the bonding. But you do need from your VNF vendor, uh, possibly, uh, not your VNF, from your NIC vendor, you need uh, VF trusted support, especially if you're running VLANs and VLAN tagging, because you need to um, overwrite the MAC of your, when you're doing a failover, you need to overwrite the MAC so that your slave can take over, uh, your slave interface can take over, and that is a limited feature on, um, on certain NICs, and so we, have, we are constantly adding new NICs that support trusted VF, but this is a must. If you don't have it, your failover probably won't work. And OBS DPDK, we have DPDK bonds now, and you can support LACP as well. Uh, now, everything goes through DPDK, and you will have separate NICs. You have your provider network separated out from your management network, uh, but they're going through the same vhost, uh, same OBS DPDK bridges. And in this case, bonding is happening on the vSwitch, and you can do DPDK bonds, or if you're using just vanilla OVS with kernel, you can do um, OVS or kernel bonds. And quickly about high availability of the VNFs today, we have uh, multiple VNFs that, the way high availability works is VNFs work together in a cluster, and you have standby and active VNFs. When one VNF is, and they're syn continuously synchronizing their state with each other. If one VNF goes down, the standby VNF doesn't hear from it, it takes over all the sessions, so you don't lose your sessions. Um, so that's, that's how it works today and between VNFs. We're also looking for, um, and so the only catch for the orchestration is the standby v and the active VNF should not be on the same host. And this is hard because OpenStack needs to know which one's a standby and which one's an active. Uh, and that's hard to do. And the second part is we've got a request to support live migration or at least cold migration of VNFs. This is when you want to upgrade to the latest, greatest OpenStack version or you want to um, upgrade your host or repair your host um, and change the NIC drivers and you want to offload all of the VNFs onto a separate host. And then you have to either cold migration, and we would like one day to support live migration, uh, but basically move all the uh, sessions off to your standby VNFs, then migrate your, copy all your VNFs on this host into network storage, copy them back on the, on the second host, and then move all the VNFs, uh, all the sessions back. And that's, that's what we would like to do, and this is work in progress as well. Yeah, briefly, the last of the, the seven pillars. Um, distributed security, and in this case, we're specifically talking about um, security groups blocking IP addresses and ports within the host operating system, within OVS or within vRouter, to make sure that you can't attack the control plane of the guest VM. You can't, there's no DDoS attacks there. Today, you can do that with Linux bridge security groups, but it, it can put a, a penalty, a big throughput penalty, not to mention it's a real pain to configure because Sometimes our, our BNG wants to control plane traffic of special kinds, UDP or other control plane traffic to go through. So it's been a real pain and it's been a performance bottleneck. And again, I, I think I'm happy to say it's mostly solved. Yep. So um, uh, we're trying to get rid of the mess of multiple bridges. Um, we have, you have Linux bridges and then you have OVS bridges. And the reason you need the Linux bridge in the middle is to put your, push your IP table rules. And that gives you a performance hit. So with connection tracking, available in OVS 2.5 uh, and 2.6 for the DPDK version. So now you can do um, all your, all your um, IP table security groups in OVS itself. This is giving you a 30% performance boost. And eventually, uh, there are NIC vendors that are looking to offload this, so you could get an additional boost if um, security groups are moved to the NIC at some point, so, so that's, that's the plan and that's the end goal, to be able to do all of your security and distributed firewalling in the vSwitch close, as close as possible to the VNF that you want instead of uh, far away on some third party appliance. Good. And taking it away, this is repeat of all the seven, yeah. seven um, pillars that we need for NFT. A lot, a lot of information, I, I, I think that the, Overlord. No, but uh, hopefully that was useful. I mean, the bottom line is we're looking at if we had to deploy it today, and we do deploy it today in a real production network, and we actually are deploying in real production networks now, what would you do? How close are we? And um, I think we're about to, we, we could do it today in a sort of a basic way with a lot of compromises. 
I think we're, we're about better. to we're about to get better and remove some of those compromises. So, and we I, highlighted some of the compromises that we've made and what we need to really get yeah. get there. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of improvements in the next year. I don't. If anyone had any questions? Feel free to to shout out. It's kind of a super specialized application, but when people say NFV, we thought we'd bring you a real network function, broadband network gateway. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know how sure about the synchronization of IP tables from one server to another. You mean that for stateful high availability of one VNF to another? Uh, not, not a lot, because all you're really passing is what is this state? So yeah, it's not exactly IP table related, but what is the state? How many? If there's 100,000 broadband subscribers connected, they'll have 100,000 IP addresses. You can hand 100,000 20 byte messages across to the backup control plane fairly quickly. So it's on the order of you know, less than a gig. Um, if that's what you're asking about, like this one. Is that the? Yeah, the IP tables is used more for blocking things that come in from attacking the guest. So your IP tables is just saying, if it's coming from uh, you know, a, a closed network, don't let it through. If it's got a, the wrong protocol, the wrong port number, or the wrong protocol ID, don't let it through. It's like a trivial, for networking, we consider a trivial firewall that, that just does port blocking. Um, so what we're saying here is- And it does connection is, tracking too, so you can- Connection tracking. You can do TCP connection tracking. Yeah, so what we're saying here is that the Linux table, Linux, that's done by Linux Bridge today. Ancient technology. It'll choke you down to 200,000 packets per second through your bridge, which sucks. So that's gone. You can do everything you need to, you could do before with Linux tables, now you can do with OVS. And now your throughput is up to 500,000 without DPDK, and I think you're offering 4 million yeah. with DPDK. No, no, no. That's just completely within the server itself. Yeah. Okay, okay. Good question. Yeah. Did you come up? Come up? Um, how is this level of performance comparing to V routers? With DPDK? V router is 5% better. No, I don't know. Uh, it's about the same. I want you to, to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you gotta, you gotta, I, I can't, I'm not going to throw out a benchmark answer for you without having a real benchmark. But uh, V router is just as good as OVS DPDK, last I heard. 4 million seems doable. A lot of variables there. Sorry, you have to ask a, a control person. But I, I really think that V router DPDK is comparable to OVS DPDK. That is true. They're comparable, uh, but V router is. A, it has a kernel piece as well. Yeah. They're moving to have a pure user space, and that is, that is the plan to have a DPDK V router at some point, and that's work in progress. So right now you do have a kernel piece that's tied to uh, the kernel, and they have tuned it to get similar, much better performance than OVS kernel, but DPDK is coming next. So then you will see the performance at the level of DPDK. But I read 3.2 has already uh, DPDK? Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm not a Contrail okay, product okay. manager. You have to ask them. I'm pretty sure it's. Yes. Thank you. Good, good, good Juniper style question. Thanks. Yeah, I open, open Juniper contrail. anybody. Open yeah, contrail. got Contrails for anybody. Yeah. So uh, in, in your original list of seven must-have, yeah. probably one thing I may suggest is uh, how about monitoring of your different uh -huh. pieces? Because I've struggled a lot with them in, in your in entire stack. If one of the piece goes haywire, 50% yeah. uh, of the effort is to find out where the problem is and what the problem is. So right. in this list, yeah. I would like to see one thing on monitoring of this entire thing for an NFV specific scenario. Great, great do, comment. Great. Do you have a sub-second yeah. latency to figure out where the fault is? Right. I mean, we were struggling with getting 
seven. We wanted 10 we or had 15. 10. <laughs> um, no, but that's a really tough one. Yeah. And especially if you're, it's depending on if you're using SRIOV or VertIO, you have to watch what the bridge, you? you have to watch the NIC, you have to watch the guest. Uh, we have a new, Juniper has a new tool app, Formix, that will solve a piece of the problem, but uh, that's an open question. Good, good comment. And OpenStack Thanks. has um, a project called Skydive that allows you to monitor all of OpenV switches. All the OpenV switches are distributed across all your compute nodes. So if you are looking for monitoring, yeah. that's something to But uh, we need a trace route, route. <laughs> yeah, trace which, route. which touch everything that touches you know, for, for OpenStack. Good, right, good. and that's a good point. Service assurance is a big one, Great. definitely. Absolutely. Good comment, thanks. And latency. So we're doing performance right now, throughput, but latency is the next one and jitter will be after. All right, more questions, comments? Time's up? Well, Greg Smith at Juniper, I have a card here. Thanks for your time.